Verses is, I was glad when they said to me, Come to the house of the Lord. Amen. That fills me with so much excitement, especially with the restrictions going down. You know, wouldn't be nice for all of us to come together to this place. And we will all be glad, we'll all be joyful to come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, we just thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity, O oh God. Thank you for the freedom, Lord, to worship your name, O oh God, in this wonderful country, in this beautiful city, O oh God. Lord, we just welcome you, Lord, in this place. We welcome you to our hearts as we sing these songs with one voice, Lord, as your children, as your people, as your nation, Lord God. We pray that you will be glorified, O oh Lord, because this is all we desire, Father to lift your name and to glorify your name for you are worthy oh god thank you jesus thank you jesus we give you all the glory and praise today hallelujah all we need is you oh god you are everything to us lord hallelujah. i left my fear by the side of the to my knees as I lift my hands to pray. God, every reason to be here again. Father's love that draws me in. And all my eyes, my seeds, a glimpse of you. And all I need is you.
talk too much. God knows what we need. And he wants to hear us ask, because we have not, because we ask not, but sometimes all he wants us to ask is just for him to be him. To just come and do his thing, because he could do it better than we could ever ask for. Sometimes all we have to do is stand there and say, God, you know what? I'm available. I don't even know for what, but I'm available right now. I'm your vessel. So we're just going to stay here for a little bit, and all we're going to do is ask for him to reign, because this is his kingdom, amen. Amen. So if we're going to say it's his kingdom, let's put him in the place on the throne right now with our praise. Father, I thank you that you know how to do a deep work in us. Romans 8 talks about our spirits groaning in the Spirit of God, knowing where to come and meet us. That we can ask you to just let it rain. Pour out your Spirit on us, Lord. You fix the things we don't even know are broken. You heal places where we, we recognize there's, there's a deeper work. There's more Amen. to be done. And sometimes there's not more to be said, but just like we prayed. God, you, you work where you know you need to work. You restore what, what's been broken. You, Lord, I pray you may have to dig up some wells that have been filled in because you've got to get down to where the offense happened, where the crisis took place, where the pain hit. And you want to get right down to those places and do that deep work, Lord. Help us in worship as we allow your presence to sweep over us to get to that place where we're just inviting you to do more in us, more, more in us, deeper in us. Things that our subconscious or our, the thoughts in the front of our mind, we've forgotten about, but we've just lived on default with, with the pain, with the struggle, with the whatever, God. And we just open ourselves this morning and allow you to do your work, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit rain down on us, Lord, as your promises that you will pour out your spirit in the last days, we're in them, and you're, you're available today, God. So we thank you for every work you're, you're doing, every work you're about to do. And we give you all the praise and glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Kind of easy today, just over here, here. 
double duty. Mel texted me this morning and said, "Are you doing? Or what am I doing for announcements?" I'm like, "I'm pretty sure I'm doing them." So anyway, <laughs> it's all—it's easy actually. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, uh, did the groundhog see a shadow? Does anybody even know? It's funny. It used to be a big deal. Now it, it six more weeks, so it did see it. So, or we're stuck in punks. At, eh? Or we're all stuck in Punxsutawney for the same day over in Emmett. <laughs> a lot of some people know what that means anyways. Um, uh, welcome to City Christian. Welcome online viewers. Um, yeah, it's a great day in the house of the Lord today. Um, I'll just go through announcements here. Um, next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. We are, in spite of the fact the 49ers aren't in it and should have been, but that's okay. I won't go there. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, yeah, next Sunday here at 6 o'clock, um, Rick Shock will have details on that. I'm not sure as far as snacks and all that sort of thing, but. Bring your own and bring Mary's contributors. There you go. Okay, sorry. So bring your own and. Bring some more. We're going to hand out some commentaries. There you go. One person. Okay, yeah. that's good. Okay, go whatever team. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> My team's not in it, no. Rams and uh, Bengals, so anyways. Um, youth group went tobogganing on uh, Friday night. Good fun. I missed out. I'm sorry. <laughs> the big kid in me. Anyways, um, this week, uh, sorry, this week, uh, crafts and games here, Friday night, youth. Okay. Um, Online study group, Chuck Price, starting the 16th on uh, end times and a theological version or uh, look at it opposed to uh, what's going on. So the um, way I understand it, uh, Zoom, and then if you have questions, you email to Chuck, correct? Well, here. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Anyway, looking forward to that. Everybody knows Chuck, so I'm sure he'll bring some flavor to it, so to say the least, so... Um, following up our uh, solemn assembly, um, um, sorry, March 30th, we, we uh, had talked about doing quarterly prayer. We had such a, a positive result out of the uh, solemn assembly in January. We talked about doing it quarterly just to have more, more regular intervention with God. So um, March the 30th, 6.30 here. So anyways, I would recommend all to come out. I mean, I know I got a lot out of it, and I know a lot of people got a lot out of it as well. So anyways. Um, annual business meeting, we will have a date for you next week. Um, I think that's it. Um, yeah, no, I'm just trying to think as far as AGM. We don't have any announcements as far as meeting goes. So, um, yeah, um, giving at the box in the back, or if you want to give online on the Canada Helps link on our website, uh, you know how to do that. There's also the black box out front, which you can drop your ties and offering on in and, uh, it's check daily. So anyway, we'll invite the kids up now and uh, we'll pray over them and the offering if the kids would like to come up now. Youth in church, isn't it great? Sunday service, yes. Oh, yes. We've been waiting for a long time, so anyways, I can remember having two or one or anyways, it's nice to see youth in, in church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our youth, Lord. We thank you that, uh, that uh, they're in your hands and not ours, Lord. And uh, we pray that uh, as our teachers go down that uh, you would have word for them and uh, it is your word that sticks with them and it's eternal with them, Lord. We just pray into... Uh, the offering of this church, we pray that uh, it's a blessing to you, and we do it with a cheerful heart and, a, and an honor to do so. We just pray unto our children, we pray unto the congregation, we pray unto the church. We just ask all this in your name. Amen.
It's coming. It's doing the little circle thing. There we go. The dreaded circle, the dreaded hourglass, the dreaded blue screen of death, right? Excellent. It's a privilege to be in front of you this morning. I, I got to sit and take worship in today. It was awesome. And uh, we have such a great worship team. They, they don't do it for the, the glamour or whatever. They just serve. But uh, yeah, it was really nice this morning. I was like, wow, I get to just go over my notes so I maybe don't talk as long. Everybody said amen, right? Yeah, woo-woo. <laughs> just one other note on announcements. Um, we, I, I think I'm a little bit hot somewhere. I'm bouncing back a bit. Um, we were talking, Pastor Chuck said, uh, all hands on deck, he's sending another container to Cuba, and one of the things he's trying to, to uh, send there, because of just where there's a lack, is some vitamins, and some of you have already heard about that and already been giving. Uh, here's what we didn't explain. If you would like to give uh, a number of, of uh, medications, we're trying to do it in small doses, small bo- bottles, just because that helps with distribution. If you give a bottle of 10,000, it's hard to give you them up and put them in plastic bags and look like it's legit, right? Like we just, so <laughs> if we have the smaller uh, containers, we appreciate that. We need them this week because by the end of this week, I need to make sure they get to Rod Parker, who's Pastor Chuck's um, facilities manager. He takes care of the, the storage and the shipping and all that kind of stuff. And uh, lots of people have been putting into this. I think he's got two skids right now that are almost full of medications that we've been giving to make sure they end up in the container and on their way to Cuba. So thank you already. Uh, Here's how it works here. If you would like to, you can just donate them and that's the end of it. Or if you want, you could submit the receipt by putting it in your offering envelope and just marking under missions, do uh, missions uh, meds or missions reapers. And so that receipt will be counted to you as giving here for missions, okay? And and we can handle it that way if you'd like a receipt for that. or just give them. That's, that's totally fine also. We appreciate all the support we've already gotten for that. Uh, we are doing this online study on the end times. It's a biblical study, first of all, not a current events, as Mike said. And if you um, are online and saying, you know, I'd love to come, but I'm still wanting to stay at home, just still needing to distance, or if you happen to hit a time of isolation right when this lines up, it's only four Wednesdays, but we do have a link. And so if you want to watch that from home, uh, we'll offer you that link. Just email me or call into the office uh, before Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we'll make sure you have that link to connect uh, with Pastor Chuck. We are doing it here for a couple of reasons. Some are not as tech savvy and would like just to have it done for them. Others would really like to get together in person and do that, and we celebrate that as well. The other thing is, um, as Mike said, if you watch Pastor Chuck, you can then send him a question, and the, by the next week, he'll try and deal with it. He'll get back to you. But if at the moment you want to dialogue with it, then you can also do that here and I'm not Pastor Chuck, but I will, I'll do my level best. And if I don't know the answer, I will find out and make sure it's a biblically-based answer on the end times. Um, because some people are totally up on it, and some people know bits and pieces of it. And, and then some people don't even know it at all. They've been afraid to read that book because they don't understand it. I'm probably more to the middle, to the front of that, hopefully, I like to think. So we will have conversation about that following those messages right here live as well. So you can uh, do that if you'd like. We'll still be distance and all that, but it'll be on the big screen, uh, as will um, the game of teams whom we don't know and don't care. No, <laughs> there will be food here, but we're going to do the distribution, men, and uh, it'll be a great time. I'm going to be here regardless of whoever else. Um, I'm going to get into this message called, I highly doubt it. Maybe you've heard that uh, sentiment before. I highly doubt that. I think more and more today than any other time, you hear things, you see things, and your first response is, I highly doubt it. Like, I'm not sure we're getting the whole story, or we're getting the story, and it's like, I caught a fish, how big? Well, it was about this big, and then you go tell it again. I caught a fish, and literally, it was about this big. You should have seen this fish. It was big. I can't reach how far this fish was. (laughs) It was a sturgeon, basically. It was seven feet long. No, just kidding. Stories sometimes have a way of of changing and growing or shrinking or taking a left turn. There's a game we play at youth called Two Truths and a Lie because we want to raise up this next generation to know how to tell. No, it's a game. (laughs) The The goal is to tell two truths about yourself and then make something up. And the fun is to hear those three things and then say, okay, Pastor Steve, uh, yeah, born in Oakville. Uh, 
lived in Mississauga, and is a helicopter pilot. Um, doesn't fly a helicopter, right? And that's how, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I wish. Uh, and, and these days, it's really tough to discern the truth. And I'm gonna, we're going to walk through a miracle that Jesus did, not just because it was a miracle, but because the whole rest of the chapter is people trying to ascertain what actually took place. But we're going to start, of course, in James 5, 1, 5 to 8, which says this, if any lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave who is blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So those who lack wisdom, it says we can ask for it. And I would say today is a more important day to ask for wisdom than at any other time, to discern what the actual truth is. How do we find the truth? How can we understand what's truly going on and what do we do about it? The news will give us all, all kinds of opinion and perspective, their perspective. And there is a source, though, that is true. And it's not just about current events. In fact, there are more important things than current events. Sorry to tell some of you who've got a feed every... Bzz, oh, there's another feed. Oh, something else has happened. Bzz, you get notifications from this, this news feed and that news feed and... And then Facebook and YouTube, which is, you know, from anybody. It's important that while we still pay attention to some current events, that we know what's actually happening, not even in the natural realm, but in the supernatural realm. And it's important to recognize that what's really true, what we really need to be focusing on, is, is building the kingdom of God. Not the, not the building of, of any city or any province or country, but, but what is God up to and how are we getting behind what he's up to? How are we being used to build the kingdom of God and bring God glory? That is the actual question we should be asking. But discerning the truth, it can, it can be difficult. Just making sure this mic doesn't jump out at me later on. The word of God is our truth, right? All right that was pretty good. I almost got a whole group involvement. The word of God is our truth, Amen. We don't need to question that. But in it, God deals with the pursuit of finding out what is true. There is a few important aspects that we need to, in order to know what God's calling us to do, what He wants us to understand, how He wants us to live. And of course, John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So whatever else y'all want to talk about, I don't think Jesus said y'all, there's no translation in the Greek, but He says, whatever else you want to talk about, I am the way the truth, and the life. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to call you to myself. It's a question of faith and belief. Hebrews 11, 6, you know this, right? It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. That's the deal. We, it takes a measure of faith. As smart as we are, as unsmart as we are, uh, you know, whatever else we think we have, it takes a measure of accepting that what God says is true. Just like it takes a measure of faith to believe in something like evolution. There's a leap there somewhere. There's things that don't all connect. The, the idea that, that we're billions of years old and the ice age came, and yet whenever you dig down into the earth, uh, the different elements aren't all jumbled in different places like it got frozen. They're all layered in, in uh, levels of density, as if they were underwater. Kind of like a flood, just saying. So, we, we want to make sure that we, we, don't, we, we can't be doubting. And of course, there's that famous verse in John 20, 27, the famous disciple, known only famous for his doubting, Thomas. He said, Thomas, put your finger here in my hands and reach your hand and put it in my side where the spear was. He says, and stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. And to the disciples who were in the boat with Jesus during a rough storm in the sea, they had to wake him up. He was not obviously bothered by this storm one bit, or he was a very sound sleeper. I'm not sure which. Matthew 8, 25, it's like me after a sermon Sunday morning. I watch football for half of it, and then I'm gone. It just doesn't matter what the score is. They'd have to wake me up and say, Pastor, pray for this game. Obviously, I didn't pray hard enough. My team isn't there either. 
He's in this storm in the boat and it's rocking. And these, most of these disciples, right, they're professional fishermen, so they get the sea, but they're bothered, right? The disciples woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, okay, guys, I'll help you take care of this. Just, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> no, he goes, you of little faith. Now, maybe he hadn't had his coffee. Maybe he was irritated by being woken up from his nap. His first thing out of his mouth is, well, you guys have no faith. Oh, good morning to you too. <laughs> it's interesting his response. Lord, save us. We're about to drown. He says, oh, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and it became completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I love it. So we stop doubting. We also stop fearing. It says, don't be afraid. No matter what current events say, the Bible says, don't be afraid, even in the midst of the storm. He delivers them, and then he seems upset or disappointed by them. And here's, I think, why. Because they missed an opportunity to exercise their faith, their authority. You know who could have calmed that storm? Any one of those disciples. In the midst of it, they could have stood up and did what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus says, greater things will you do in my name. So yeah, it's his power, yeah, it's his authority, but he gave it to you and to me. Stop doubting, stop fearing. They could have either A, calmed the storm, or believed God that he could get them through it safely, even with the wind and the waves. Hey, we're with Jesus. It doesn't matter if the, you know, we're going up and down, we're getting seasick. We are going to make it to the other side because of Jesus so we're going to look at chapter, the whole chapter of John 9. We're going to try and get through the whole thing. I'm going to take it apart, but it is important. And for those who are online, I want you to know we're taking communion this morning. We're going to end with the idea of faith and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and His resurrection. In John 9, there's, it's the healing of the blind man, but it, and the miracle is fantastic, but the dialogue after is what we're looking at today. The people who have seen God work but don't understand it. The neighbors, the religious leaders seeking the truth, and the religious leaders who simply didn't want to believe anything supernatural. People who love their position in God but deny the power of God. It's serious doubt. And so I have a whole list of things we're going we're gonna to chop it up. Uh, teaching on purpose and the power of healing, uh, verses 1 to 5, and the healing of mud. Yeah, it's all there. The healing with mud, the neighbors and the testimony. Legalism versus the sign and how that brought division. Uh, the man who did something supernatural is Jesus. The parents speak the truth and then they deflect because they're afraid of the establishment. Judgment versus truth. Jesus is from God, whether you like it or not. I like that. And then Jesus and the seeing man. And if you know better, believe better. That's where we're going. So everyone buckle up. I'm going to read chapter John, uh, John chapter 9. And, I, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it, okay? It's a big portion of scripture. I don't normally do this, but... The whole thing kind of struck me about right where we at right now, trying to figure out what is true and what isn't. And this whole uh, journey they've been on to ascertain what's going on. And some of them were never really interested in the truth at all. It's quite sad. And others finally recognized, listen, God's done something here. Stop trying to plow it over and ignore the fact that it happened. So it says, as he went along, he saw a man, this is Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened to the, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works for him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And later he calls us and says, you are the light of the world, right? Verse 6, he's after saying this, he spit on the ground and made a little bit of mud with saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Counterintuitive, I think, for clear vision, but that's what he does. He says, go, he told him, wash in the pool of shalom, which means scent. And so the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. And his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was, others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. How were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam 
and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. It's that simple. Man, mud, wash, sight, crazy. Then they turned again to the blind man and said, What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He's a prophet. Oh, sorry, some Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Then others said, um, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned to the blind man and said, What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. He didn't even understand that Jesus was the Messiah yet. He just knew that this man was used to help him gain his sight. They still did not believe. I hate that verse, but I love it at the same time. You recognize people who don't have the Holy Spirit bring illumination or revelation will not see the truth that's literally staring them in the face. No pun intended. The man couldn't see. Now he could see. And they were like, yeah, nope, nah, nope, no, I don't, no way. Still fighting it. Verse 18, sorry. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Ask mom. Whenever you're in doubt, go ask mom. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Like it's their fault, right? <laughs> On the hot seat. Verse 20. We know, he's your, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the, the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. They understood the climate of the day. You talk about this Jesus like he's some kind of deity, like he's got some kind of God power. We're not going to be happy. So what's your answer again? And the parents kind of chickened out a little bit. Well, he was blind and now he can see. I, I don't know who did it. I claim the fifth. You know, go talk to someone else about it. Now, in all fairness, we don't know that they were there when the healing took place. So maybe... Some of it was out of ignorance, but it even says the motive behind it is they were afraid that the establishment was going to come down on them for telling the truth. Scary thought. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. The parents said, he's of age, ask him. Verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. I love that. All spiritual. Give the Lord glory by telling the truth. And then the next line, he said, we know this man's a sinner. Okay, so... Spiritually, let's glorify the Lord, but here's our judgment. Okay? He replied, and I love this, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is I was blind, and now I can see. Take that. You, you, you can decide what you want about this guy, prophet Jesus, dude who touched me, put mud on my eyes. I don't know if he could see if he would have let Jesus put mud on his eyes or not, but... He went and washed, he did what he was told, and now he could see. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Verse 26, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> I, don't know if he, I don't know if that was sarcasm or just what. I'd love to have seen his face. They, were, they had started hurling insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't even know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. The testimony speaks, right? We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the guy who can see now. Who knew he was a preacher already, right? He's like, let me tell you something. So they didn't like it, right? Verse 34. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Don't like it? Out you go. Okay, thanks. Spiritual blindness, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And what does he do? Just like the Savior, the good shepherd. When he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. 
You have seen him because I healed you. You can see. You've seen him and the one speaking to you is he. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and that those who will see will become blind. And some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. That's where it ends. We don't see if they liked it or not. But anywhere along this path, the religious leaders, the neighbors, the people who didn't understand could have seen this miracle and had their lives transformed. They could have said, this is the living God. This is the real deal. This is something supernatural. We all know this guy was blind from birth. And now he can see. Something took place here, something. And instead, they're arguing about position and who's a sinner and who they're listening to. Listen, our authority all comes from the Word of God. We don't take part of it and spit out the bones. The whole Word of God is God's truth, His Word to us. So you can't take just the parts you like and then spit out the stuff that you're not so comfortable with. First of all, believe who God is, His nature, His character. And then the stuff that's hard to wrestle with, we bring it in line with His character, and that helps us gain understanding. And through the Holy Spirit, we get revelation of what He's trying to teach us. But this was a simple case of God moves supernaturally, and some people, they got it. Some people, they missed it, but we're, we're trying to work through it. And some people, it didn't matter if Moses came back and parted this Red Sea again. These people were not going to change their hardened hearts. Now, I know he's talking to people who are not believing in him, and I'm talking to people who came here because they know Jesus. You know Jesus on some level. Or you know someone who does and they drug you to church. I don't know you, know. you are here today or you're watching today because Jesus Christ has made a difference to almost 2,000 years ago. He died on the, I, you know what? I got used to saying almost 2,000 years ago. It's now 2022, so just over 2,000 years ago. We got I to get that right. Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins and then three days later rose from the dead. We're getting ready to celebrate Easter. And by the way, there are discussions about what that will look like. And I'm hoping and praying that after two years, we might be able to get together with people. But until I know for sure what's going on, I'll let you know when I do. I just know people are getting excited about worshiping on a broader context. And we pray that that, that will be something we have the opportunity to step into very soon. So let, let's go back to that list I said, because it's important. Verse 1 to 5, we see this, this doctrine of healing. And, and also we see this doctrine of of brokenness, okay? Because when sin entered the world, we, we had a sin nature, but we also were broken. We weren't going to live forever. We were going to have issues with our bodies sometimes. And the first thing that disciples do is they spiritualize this man's blindness. Oh, oh, did he do something bad? Is that why he's broken? Well, that could be, but it also could be we live in a broken world where there, we have a sin nature, where our bodies are not perfect, and so there are some times where we deal with infirmities and things that we have to deal with. It's not because we're holy or unholy people. It's because my body doesn't want to do what I want my body to do all the time. And yes, we can pray to God for healing. But the, what they were suggesting was the same thing Job's friends suggested. That, that because of his actions, there was judgment. And his infirmity was that judgment. And Jesus is saying, no. He had to deal his whole life with blindness, but it was for this very moment where I, the Son of Man could be glorified. I can prove that not only Jesus is the Messiah, that supernatural things can happen, that God has power over our physical and mental, emotional, our souls, and our spirits. He has authority over all of it. And so in that first five verses, it's God's glory and God's light that he explains. And then verse 6 and 7, the healing with mud, man's trust in God's healing. He has to be made whole, and I would never go to a doctor, an eye doctor, and try and find out what my prescription was and let that guy put mud in my eyes, let alone from his own spit. I mean, especially after COVID, right? Now, you want to purify that spit first somehow, you know, put some hand sanitizer on the spit, then make mud, I, and, then here, and then put it in your eye? I don't like hand sanitizer or mud in my eye. Like I, and, and now, 
We don't know if his eyes were closed or open, whatever. He put mud on it and said, now go wash this out. And when you wash it out, you're going to be able to see. I don't know any medical doctor that would have written that prescription, right? Take this to shoppers. They've got some mud there for you, little capsules of mud. It would seem like a really strange idea. I think that the reason God sometimes asks you to do strange things, whether it's in worship, you know, raise one hand. Okay, raise them both now. Now wave them in the air or, or, or dance. And Why? Why do I have to do that? Well, you don't have to, but maybe God's asking you to step out like David did and where he danced before the Lord. And he said, I'll become even more undignified than this. I will approach someone and say, I'm praying for you. I'll approach someone and ask if they're okay and, and ask if I could pray for them or uh, I could share Jesus with them. I will step outside of my comfort zone. Why? Because sometimes God is leading us there. Would I let put, someone put mud on my eyes? I don't know. I don't think so. But at that moment, he must have known something. With a little bit of faith, with a little bit of trust, I'm going to step outside of what I think is normal and do what I think God is leading me to do. And in stepping out like that, in faith... Not doubting, but in faith. Jesus, I came to the right person. Whatever you tell me to do. You want to make mud and pack it all over my face? You know, Give me a facial? Fine, I'm good with that. You want me to go wash in this water? I'll go do it. And he does it. His faith and God's healing. It was a beautiful thing. If that man didn't have faith, this would have been a really short chapter. He, he's blind. He asks for help. Jesus comes to him, puts mud on his eyes. It doesn't work. He doesn't have the faith. He doesn't get healed chapter ends there. We move on with the rest of the story of Jesus, but his faith and God's power, what a powerful combination. And he's healed. And so the neighbors get into it, and you know what? Doubters are going to doubt. They're torn with the facts. This guy who didn't change his appearance from sitting at, you know, begging to standing in front of them and coming to the synagogue, same guy, same haircut, same outfit, right? Same sandals. Oh, you've got the Nikes. It's the same guy, right? Nike sandals. Now, he didn't change his appearance at all, except that he could now see through his eyes. So there's nothing in his appearance to make him look strange. And they're all like, I'm not sure if you're that guy. Same beard, same hair, same whatever, same color of eyes, maybe, unless they were opaque and then they were clear. Same voice, same sense of humor, same personality. He went home to the same address that night. Mom and dad let him in. And yet they're questioning, who is this guy really? You're his doppelganger, right? You're his twin. You just look like him. People try so hard not to believe in the supernatural. They want it to be the last thing that they embrace. And I believe it's because, well, in North America, it's because we're we're too scientific method. You've heard me talk about that, right? Whatever the five senses tell me, that's reality. Whatever science tells me, the scientific method, if I can put it through a bunch of tests, then I can determine it. Well, you can't always know the way of the Lord. You can't always see supernatural things. You can't see the Spirit of God, but you can see the effects of the Spirit of God. That's why when we talk about His presence, we talk about His manifest presence. Because God is already here right now, in you, in me, in this place. But when He manifests, when we see people break out in tears or laughter, when we see people run to the altar and fall on their knees, when we see people get healed, we don't go, yeah, I don't know about that. We go, thank you, God, that you're manifesting your presence. We accept that in faith, that you've just done something profound. And instead of doubting it and having a debate and argument about it, we should be having a hallelujah celebration because God's done something. You know, in our solemn assembly, sometimes the very next day after we prayed for something, God already broke through and did something. I've heard about physical healings. I've I've heard about people, uh, you know, fighting with... with, um, establishment, getting from one wrong place to a good place, from a prison to a care facility. Like, God just did some really cool things where he stepped already up and answered some of the prayers we've already prayed. That's why we're coming back to it every quarter. And if that works, we'll do it a quarter of the quarters. We'll do it every 16th note. Sorry, I'm a musician. We'll do it as often as as we can. We'll pray for revival and see what God can do. The neighbors and the testimony. I love he just keeps sharing his testimony. I don't know all the answers. I just know... I was blind, but now I see. And then verse 13 to 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees go, well, we've never seen this in church before. Can't be good. God didn't do it through us. Can't be good. It didn't happen in my order of service. I had an order of service and healing was not on there. Can't be good. In fact, when we pray here before church sometimes, we pray for God. Here's our order of service, Lord. Take it. 
It's yours. And if you want to wreck it, if you want to do something, be free to do what you want to do in it, right? And we believe that God can do that. So there's, there's legalism. There's these guys saying, well, uh, you know, I don't believe that this guy is, we, we don't know that he's heard from God. We believe in Moses, but we don't believe this guy. And there's division. After a miracle, there's division instead of celebration. Healing, not on the order of worship. Oh, yeah, I already mentioned that. I want God to move with us or in spite of us. No matter what, I want God to move, period. And you can agree with me on that, right? God, shake us up, wake us up. If we're doing things because we're too stuck in a rut, Holy Spirit, just give us a little gentle, a little tap on the head. The man did something supernatural. Verse 17. That The man is healed. He says, uh, I think this guy might be a prophet. I don't know. Like, I've never seen him before. I just know his name is Jesus. And I was blind, but now I can see. And someone who's in touch with supernatural power, he's like, I don't know how else this could have happened. And then they go to the parents who kind of chicken out, but... He said, yeah, he's our son. Yeah, he was blind. And yes, now he can see. Now you go look for how it happened because we're not going to venture. We're not stepping into that one. We're not are debating this thing. It's going to become an argument about your position and, and our belief in what actually happened there. And we're not getting into it. And then the, the judgment versus the truth. And you heard me. He got all spirit. They said, spiritually, you know, glorify the Lord. Tell the truth, the truth that we want you to say. And we know this man's a sinner. Oh, did you want me to share or did you want to tell me what to share and then I can share it for you, right? And he says, no, no, that's not it. It's like, you can decide whether this man's a sinner or not. You're in that lofty position or spiritually or whatever. You want to be a judge, that's fine. All I know is I was blind and now I see. When the supernatural happens, we know that God is at work. Amen? And we want God to be at work. And I never want us to be in judgment. You can say, well, how can God use someone like that? Well, first of all, it was Jesus. But how could God use that, that blind guy who just sat there his whole life? All of a sudden, he's the center of a healing ministry. <laughs> all of a sudden, he's got everyone's attention. He never did anything to deserve that. But God called him to be that person to testify in that moment that something real was taking place. He had a ministry in a day. He didn't do four years of Bible college or his master's of divinity. He just was, is encountered a move of the Holy Spirit and then was testifying about it. And we need to do that too. Whether we think it's a big deal or a small deal. Being blind since birth, I think that's a big deal. But whether you think your miracle is big or small, don't even worry about it. Just always give glory to God. Always. No matter what it was. I had a great day today. Glory to God. Well, that's no big deal. I've had a good day before. Well, did you glorify God for it? Because you had an opportunity. You had an opportunity. If you have an opportunity, bring glory to God. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Let's give Him the glory. Jesus is from God, whether you like it or not. See, the guy has been testifying for so long, and, and the doubters are going to doubt, the haters are going to hate. Finally, he says, listen. You, and he starts preaching at him. You saw what I read, right? You say that the only, pe only people who hear from God can do these things, and yet you guys have never healed anyone from blindness, and this guy did, so you tell me what's going on. And of course, instead of actually at that moment going, oh, you know what, you're right, there, I, could, I could understand something here. I could make a shift in my mind. Maybe something's going on beyond me. Maybe we can get out of our own heads, our own image of the way we think the world should be, and believe that something outside of that could take place. And church, I want every one of us to have that kind of faith. I think I understand the way things are in my world. I think you understand. Been on this planet a few decades. I won't say how many for each of us. No, no embarrassment. You have some experience. You've been through some stuff. And yet I pray every day from when I'm 9 to when I'm 99. I only plan on being around until I'm 88. But should the Lord tarry. I want to always be ready to accept a move of God. If there's something that's going on outside of myself, I want to see that and say, you know what, if it's God, I want it. I, I was ministering in a conservative evangelical church some years back, 
And uh, the pastor's son was, was, did worship with me, and we had a great time ministering to the young adults ministry there in, in Toronto. And uh, I was Pentecostal, and, and so some people were all like, okay, we're, you're at this conservative church, but you're one of those. <laughs> so thanks for coming, but we're just going to take you with a grain of salt there. You know, you, just, you might go, woo, on me all of a sudden, so you just stay over there, right? But no, we had a genuine relationship, and this guy was a, a young man who was, he knew the Bible, and he was a man of prayer, unbelievable. And so I talked to him about encountering God in worship and his manifest presence that I'm sharing this morning. And, and he, he's like, I, I don't know, I haven't been raised in that, I don't know about all that. And he said something I'll never forget, and this was probably 20 years ago. He said, all I know is if it's from God, I want it. If it's from God... I want it. If there's healing, God, I want it. If there's new life, if there's some kind of supernatural thing, even if it looks weird in the natural, but all of a sudden you feel the peace and power of God sweep over you, I want it. I want that. I've been saved since I was nine, and then I rededicated my life when I was 17, and I pray that God will continue to reveal himself. Hello, sister. Yes. Can you hold on one second? Because the people online want to hear. And then I'll finish my five more points. No, I'm just Two kidding. years ago, I couldn't raise my hand this high. So I'd come up here and worship with this. We had a week of prayer and fasting here. Here I am. <laughs> That's right. That's right. God is still in the healing business. That's right. And I am a witness to this because my daughters here shall testify different ones that when I put my coat on, this arm went in first because I couldn't raise it. So give God the glory. Right on. And this, if this blind man can see, and I can raise this. This woman can praise. (laughs) God be the glory. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. As you can appreciate, the scripture from John chapter 9 happened a while ago, 2,000 years ago, right? This miracle, among others from our psalm assembly, had happened a month ago, right? And still, it wasn't one of those hype things where she just got emotional that one night and felt like she raised it a little more. She's raising both hands now. God has done some incredible things. And we sometimes tell our story and go, oh, that's nice, and then we move on. I think we need to continue to focus on those things that God did. Some of you know, because uh, we've, we've been here eight years, we're in our ninth year, you probably heard most of my stories. I know my kids have. They go, oh yeah, that one. They could probably finish the story I'm going to share, right? But I don't ever want to get tired of talking about what God has done for me and what God has done for you. And we should continue to do that. And I'll tell you why, because there are people who are doubting that will never experience the Spirit of God and will never step into the truth. Haters are going to hate. Doubters are going to doubt. But there are people who are questioning and wondering about this God, about this Bible, about walking in faith, and they're really not sure what to do about it, but because they're genuinely searching. Ask, seek, and knock. You have not because you ask not, right? Seek first His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I'll settle all that stuff. Seek me and I will show you the truth. And he does that. And this man who was trying to explain to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, after a while, he just said, you know what? That's it. He said, I couldn't see. Now I can see. This, is, this guy has, has been in connection with God. This Jesus, there's something about him. They said, that's it. Get out. So he left. And the first thing Jesus does was he goes right to him and says, hey, sorry about those turkeys. <laughs> they don't speak for me. How would you like to meet the Messiah? By the way, you're talking to him. Salvation came from faith. Healing came from faith and then salvation. Sometimes it works the other way around. But I'll tell you what, I believe sometimes God wants to heal members in your family, people you know before they even know Jesus Christ. And you know why? So they can be healed? Sure, but you know what? That's secondary. Because my body's going to break down again between now and when I die. But when I get to heaven, I get a brand new body. Woo! Right? So, but the salvation part is key. 
because I have Jesus in my heart. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm getting my perfect body. My name's on that list already. So what other infirmity I can pray for and ask God to move in? But the most important thing is salvation. So God might be trying to reach out to some of your family members, some of your neighbors, and you might pray for them, and God could deliver a healing to them. I'll tell you what, it won't only change their physical body. It could change their eternity, right? Instead of arguing about, oh, was that God? It was a 50% God. Did the doctors help? Did the medication help? You know what? God does practical things with doctors and medicine and surgeries. and There is nothing wrong with that. You're not a lack of faith because you let a doctor help you. But where do you put your trust in? Where is your faith? My faith is in God who brought me a doctor. When we moved here, we got a doctor right away. She's awesome. She tells me I should get tests. I don't even want to get tests for her, but she is very thorough. She's very, she cares for me. She's looking out for my well-being. Praise God for that. But also, whose report are you going to believe when the doctor says, oh, you know what? We found this. We found that. We think you might be dealing with this. I said, Thank you for science. Now I'm going to my knees, and I'm asking God to move. And I want something supernatural to take place, whether it's the right prescription or and suddenly Holy Spirit goes, get up and walk. Go wash in this pool and your blindness will be gone. You will be able to see again. He does that with, with this man. He, he's, salvation comes. And then the last part, verse 30, 39 to 41. What? I, got, I typed that in wrong. Oh, here it is. I just didn't swipe down long enough. That's all. Jesus said, for judgment, this is about uh, the people who believe and the people who don't believe. And I'm almost finished here. For some fear, um, he said, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will see will become blind. It almost sounds mean. People who can see, you're not going to let them see? No. No, their hearts are hard. And so no matter what I do, I can heal the guy that's been going to their church as long as they can remember who couldn't see. And I could heal him and make him see. And some of these people are still not going to get it. Just don't let it be anyone in here. Don't let it be anyone watching today. Believe that God can do what he says he will do. And keep believing. Have faith. Hold on. And the Pharisee says, what, am I blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd be... You would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. These guys are hard, but they're still there. They're still in the conversation. At the very end, they're still saying, what, am I blind? And Jesus says, listen, you, you say you can see, but you still missed it. Even in that moment, Holy Spirit could give them that revelation. Wow, you know what? This guy's right. I've been missing it. I've been missing the truth of the gospel. I've been missing the power of God. I've been missing the supernatural things in my life. They could have said, Jesus, I, forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry. Help me. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to follow you like that blind man who could see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship you. I'm going to follow you too. It doesn't matter how far away people are from God. It doesn't matter what they say they believe or don't believe. If they have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, I mean, Saul on the road to Damascus. A Christian killer, a hater of the new way, gets miraculously transformed and starts following Jesus. So if you have a brother or sister or son or daughter who is acting like a hater of the gospel and a hater of Jesus and who rejects all things church, and that is a separate thing, by the way, because all things church, we do our best to be the light, but sometimes the church isn't perfect, right? Let's be honest. But to believe in the work of Jesus Christ and his gospel, that's important. And he can take us all and turn them to Paul. And so he can take your hardest case and let the Holy Spirit change their hearts. As we pre prepare for communion today, we want to refocus our attention on the one who sacrificed everything so that we could be made whole. Jesus came to die, and yet before he did that, on his way, he healed people. He touched people supernaturally. You know, that wasn't his purpose on, on the earth at that time. Like I came for one reason, that's to, to die on the cross for all man's sins and to rise from the dead so that people who believe in me could come to be with me in heaven for eternity, who could live out a life of being my disciple, becoming like Jesus, stepping into the promises of God. That's what I came for. But, oh, here I am bumping into this guy 
who is blind. And along the way of my purpose of going to the cross, I'm going to teach, I'm going to heal, I'm going to share the, the truth about what being in God really is and how to be in Christ. And so he heals this man. You know, we're still between here and heaven. We're still on that kind of journey where we could be intersected, interrupted, bumping into the Savior Jesus Christ. And he might have something to say about your present circumstances. Thank God he has something to say about yours and my present circumstances. That's why we take communion. Because we remember that he did all of that to bump into you and me and to bring healing power of God into our circumstances. So let's pray. Please, God, change our I highly doubt it into I don't doubt it one bit. We need you to make our blind eyes see. We need you to move miraculously in our lives. Help us with faith. Help us with our doubts. Heal our bodies. Heal our minds. Heal our spirits. Heal our attitudes. Heal our wrong ways of thinking. Help our focus be more on you than anything else. Help us honor you and serve you in the midst of anything and everything. In the midst of our our pursuit of a football game, the pursuit of our politics, and pursuit of our, our jobs, and the pursuit of our families, and the pursuit of anything else in our lives. God, we put you first. We believe that you have something to say to our story, to speak into our narrative, the supernatural power of the living God. So Holy Spirit, right now I ask as, you, as we partake in this communion, we recognize the sacrifice you made, your broken body to make us whole and your blood shed to forgive us and to restore us. God, for those of us who still struggle with sometimes some of what the the Word of God says, it's it's hard to understand, hard to embrace. Or or, or we may be struggling with our reality to say, I just want it to line up with, with the ending, the glory of heaven where everything's wonderful and there's no tears, no sickness, no more pain. We want to be in that place already. And that place is coming. But God, I pray for perseverance and I pray for faith. I pray that you would restore hope and remove doubt. I pray that you would pour in your peace when there are still more questions than answers. Because we believe in this man who was this other guy called a prophet. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in what this Bible tells us, God, about you. Not just your reality, but how you want to be in our reality. That's why we remind ourselves as we partake of this communion Because every time we take this, we remember that enormous sacrifice you made so that we could have this conversation, so that we could choose to believe. And in our free will, in our own uh, process of thought, Lord, we ask that you would interrupt us by your Holy Spirit and reveal what's true. Help us step out in faith. Faith that impacts our spirit, faith that impacts our mind, and faith that impacts our bodies. And so we just keep our, our, our heads bowed, our eyes closed, but perhaps there's something that you need a touch from God for this morning. And as we partake of communion, I can't think of a better time when we, ask, we recognize that by his stripes we're healed, that if God wants to heal your body this morning, or if God wants to heal your emotions, your heart, your mind, your way of thinking, or even to restore your spirit, we just raise your hand and say, God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asking for that prayer this morning for me. Yeah, yeah. We're going to agree together in Jesus' name for that. All those things, yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Lord, we bring these things before you, God. We need a move of God. And as we've read in your word, it can sometimes surprise us when all of a sudden you move. But God, we pray today for all of a sudden that this might be our divine appointment. And for those online who raised their hand, those who are believing in this prayer, we come together now for every need that's under this roof and within the sound of my voice, every need. And we put it in your hands, Jesus. You are the great healer, the great restorer, the great redeemer, the Messiah, our Savior and Lord. 
And on that night when you knew what was coming, you said, this is my body which is broken for you. And we take this bread to remember his broken body that offers us wholeness. Let's partake together for God's wholeness. We believe, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, do that healing work, Lord. May it be a testimony that we have. We can share with believers and unbelievers that you would restore us fully, Lord God, for your glory. Thank you, Lord. And God, for that deeper healing work that's not just in our bodies, but in our minds and our emotions, the struggles we have with sin and temptation, with discouragement and doubt, with fear. God, we just put all that at the foot of the cross this morning. According to your broken body that's made whole, we ask for wholeness in those areas. And your blood washes away sin. And your blood covers a multitude of sins. And your blood washes us white as snow. And your blood establishes us as the righteousness of Christ. And your blood redeems us, buys us back into the right relationship with you. And your blood gives us the hope of salvation, the hope of eternity with you. And we believe it. As we partake of this blood together, this cup, we remember your blood. For those purposes, thank you, Jesus, for this new relationship that's been restored in us. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and respond in this song, and then I'll close in prayer.
like snow, the sun forbear to Sing that chorus one more time. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray for our miracle, my miracle. I mean, we have the miracle of life. We thank you for it. Many of us have the miracle of salvation, and we thank you for it. But I know, God, you're still in the miracle business, and there are people in this room who need a miracle, and we, we raised our hands, we asked for those. God, I pray that he who began a good work is faithful to complete it, and that miracle is already percolating in the spirits and lives of people who have dared to say, yes, God, I need you to move in my life. God, we just seal that together with all of our faith, with all of the power of Jesus' name, according to your word, that you're doing supernatural work, Lord God, in, in relationships right now. You're doing supernatural work in people's hearts, in people's eyes, in people's organs, God. You're doing a miraculous work in joints and limbs and, and um, cartilage and uh, muscles and sinew. That's what I'm thinking. Tendons, that's the word I was looking for. God, you're doing these works right now in people's arms and legs, in people's bodies. And God, you're restoring in, in people's minds places that have been crooked that, Lord, you are making straight right now in Jesus' name, right now in Jesus' name. I'm not hyping this up. I'm declaring what you've said in your word, that you are the balm of Gilead, that you are the God who heals, that healing is the children's bread, people who come to you and long and ask you will work in their lives and it will look like however it's going to look like for your glory. But we ask and pursue wholeness. We ask and pursue for you to do a healing work in us and in the people we stood in the gap for. Some people raised hands for other people. God, I'm, I'm thinking of someone in my family right now. I'm thinking of that five-year-old, that two-year-old who's dealing with cancer right now. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for that young man who's, who's back. The screws are loose, God. Adam. We're praying for people who, who have, heart, have heart issues, God. We're praying for people who are waiting for surgeries because things have just taken too long. The system is, is overloaded. But people need a touch from you, Lord God, like never before. Or like in the days of old, when we didn't have an emergency department to go to. God, we thank you for our doctors and nurses. We pray for them, but also we pray for supernatural work right now. We've had the faith to read about it. We've had the faith to ask for it. Now, God, do it according to to your word. We give you all the praise and glory for moving in our midst. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you all.